In the dark alleyways of China, he developed a powerful instinct for survival. He knew the risks he was taking, but the temptation was far too great. The adrenaline rush and pure sense of excitement far outweighed any dangers that were lurking. A 15-year-old boy working on a basic ancient computer in a small village. He was able to use the slowest emotions to hack into the CIA's master computer, the one computer system that should have been secure. He wants to leave his mark, his calling card. He violates when no one's looking, takes advantage when guards are down. What did he do? What did he see? What did he want? Why? Fact or fiction? The story of Little Fisher's attempt at hacking into the CIA is legendary amongst the Chinese hacking community. By 2005, an estimated one billion people, one-sixth of humanity, will be online. In China, the Internet opened up an international playground to anyone with access to a computer, linking all to the cyber realm and a new world of freedom. Home to over 1 billion people, China had 54 million internet users by 2002. The internet became a place where many people can live out their fantasies, especially teenagers. Some kids who don't have the looks or personalities to gel with the in-crowd at school suddenly find this huge community welcoming them. It doesn't matter what they look like. Fat scrawny, covered in acne. The physical symptoms disappear on the They are finally in the mainstream of things. Big fish in their own right, having a whale of a time. In a world of incognitos, they hide behind symbols known as handles in internet jargon, unique and cleverly crafted to describe their personality hint at their character or even their intention without revealing their true identity. It didn't take long for some kids to discover the underground world of hacking. They began by breaking passwords on software programs and codes on new games. Hacking gave them a new way of life. This is the story of a few of these people living on the fringe. People who have made the internet their life, for better or for worse. I started hacking in 1997 because going online at that time was expensive. Going online to send an email would cost about a dollar for every kilobyte. At that time, my pay was not much. Therefore, I decided to try hacking in order to save money. Stealing names and passwords from internet service providers, he surfed the net using other people's accounts. Banyan Tree lives in Beijing. He is very cautious, nervous, constantly looking over his shoulder. It's not that he has anything to hide. His hacker days are far behind him. 
His father was a lecturer in computer science. When he died suddenly, Banyan Tree was devastated and vowed that he would make something of himself in his honor. Today, he has left a legacy in the form of hacking software. When I passed my exam in 1998, I was working in a company that gave me lots of time and energy to design various software. Luxay was the software I spent the most time on and which was the most influential. Surf the net for hacking tools, and chances are that you will locate Banyan Tree's website and Fluxay. It's free, easy to use, and works very fast, penetrating the weakest of vulnerabilities in a website. With Fluxay, a novice could easily learn hacking techniques. Wendy is Banyan Tree's colleague and very close friend. Getting a copyright for his software in China is difficult. If he had a copyright and was able to charge a dollar for every user, he would be able to afford his dream car of a yellow Ferrari. Nowadays, Banyan Tree is a successful internet security consultant and earns an income most mainland Chinese can only dream about. Asked if he still hacks today, Banyan Tree laughs. Today is my birthday. At 30, I'm too old to be a hacker. According to Banyan Tree, over 4 million people around the world have downloaded his program. 80% of these downloads were done in China. That means over 3 million people in China alone have the capability of using this hacking tool. Where are they hacking? Who are they hacking? Taking to the byways of the internet, they began to vandalize websites with graffiti, leaving their mark wherever they went, and then bragging of their victory online. Little Fish, the Chinese hacker who claims to have broken into the CIA's computer, is an example of this phenomenon. Such teenagers, bored with their real existence, find excitement and challenges on the net. The acceptance and allure of being someone special drives some of them deeper and deeper into the hacker's underground. Crackers, or black hats, as they are commonly called, are the ones responsible for most computer viruses, worms, and malicious destruction and chaos. In other words, the bad guys. iDefense is a private security intelligence firm based outside of Washington, D.C. Their director of threat intelligence is Jim Melnick, formerly from the Pentagon. It's well understood, it's out there, it's out in the public domain. Uh, they can pull it from the internet, they can share these, these basic building blocks of hacker tools with each other and go from there then to sort of enlarge their craft to maybe focus on a very specific area. A cracker will have his own collection of malicious code-breaking programs that are cleverly disguised as something benign. Known as Trojans, 
These can be installed onto an unsuspecting computer very easily. Once in place, these Trojans can reside quietly, working diligently, recording your keyboard activities, memorizing your secret passwords, your internet banking account numbers, and other private information. On the other hand, your system could be infected with a virus that wipes out all your data. The crackers have caused a stir, and now this ocean of offenders have to be caught. But policing the net can be tricky. Manila, the Philippines. What happens if one little fish slips through the net? May 2000. Onel de Guzman, college student, computer whiz, is accused of releasing the love bug, the fastest spreading computer virus known to man. Sent in an email message, it destroys all your data and then starts contaminating all the email addresses stored in your system. In a matter of hours, love bug spirals out of control causing over 10 billion US dollars worth of damage worldwide, infecting 45 million computers, including those of the Pentagon, the CIA, and the British Parliament. Hot on his tail, the FBI works closely with the Philippine National Bureau of Investigation and traces de Guzman via his telephone line connection. Filipino police make the arrest. But little fish, by their very nature, are slippery. His lawyer claims de Guzman was unaware of how destructive the virus could be. If you ask me whether or not he was aware of the consequences, I would say that uh, he was not aware. Such an action would probably have been unintentional. But there is more incriminating evidence. At college, de Guzman proposed a thesis detailing the creation of a program similar to the Love Bug. But in the Philippines, there are no nets in place, no national laws to tackle cybercrime. The chief of the National Bureau of Investigation can't hold on to this big catch. We cannot arrest him because he has not violated the law. He's not broken any law. He has to, we have to establish the fact that there was a law violated by him. So we are looking into other provisions of the law. We have no law on hacking so far. So for now, this little fish swims free. <laughs> Welcome to the murky world of the internet, where crimes know no geographical boundaries, where often no laws exist, even if the perpetrators can be apprehended. <laughs> Trying to police the cyber seas is one of Asia's economic powerhouses, South Korea. They have state-of-the-art technology that enable them to track hacking offenders. General Ok Hyun Ha of the Cyber Terror Response Center in Seoul says e-security is taken very seriously. There are so many tools now with improved technology. They are easily accessible and cheap to download from the Internet. That is one of the reasons the hackers go for it. Under the age of 20, they desire to better their techniques. They are not crime conscious. As they grow older, they become more conscious of skill, and some can take it the wrong way. One of the Korean kids who took it the wrong way is Kim Yong-jun, also known as Love You. Kim claims he is the best hacker in Korea. In a 1 to 10 ranking of hackers, I am the best. 
Kim says his reputation is what matters. To prove his prowess, he says he broke into the computer systems of two major Korean television stations, giving him the power to stop on-air transmissions. But the strong arm of law enforcement came down on Love You. Before he could even strike, Love You was locked up in prison for a month. This little fish was caught by former policeman Gadzard Lee. Uh, when I was uh, police, I arrested uh, several young person. A young person is a uh, uh, university student or a uh, high school student. Uh, the young po person is not known. The cracking is illegal. Under his guidance, Kim turned over a new leaf and now works as an internet security consultant. South Korea has a number of dedicated ethical hackers who work closely with the Cyber Terror Response Center in patrolling the Internet. Davin Kim is a dedicated ethical hacker who wants to make the Internet a safer place for everyone. He demonstrates quickly and easily how to hack into a website. Checking one system is very easy, so it will take uh, two minutes or five minutes. But it depends on their security level. But finding the target is very easy. The scary thing is, almost anyone can become a hacker. There are websites that give free advice on how to hack, and some 30,000 websites that post hacker codes. What now draws the line between a white or black hacker will depend on his ability to discipline himself in the free realm of the Internet. Now, I must start what I'm doing. Because I'm not a cracker, but a hacker. But if I have a wrong thinking, I can go further. For example, uh, I can change the website of university and paralyze that server. And also, I can change my score of uh, exam results. But no policeman can find me because that was a perfect crime. The Cyber Terror Response Center works closely with the FBI, Interpol, and a network of nine countries to track down cyber criminals. Once a break-in is discovered, it is analyzed and researched. If it's caused by a virus, we need to work closely with the victims of the attack. We identify the handle of the hackers and try to trace the identities. If the attack happens on an international level, we notify the countries involved and work closely with your law enforcement. Communist China is always fearful of disorder, and Internet operators and users are carefully policed. But even with strict regulations in place, can this new realm of potential chaos be contained? A barrier now known as the Great Firewall of China prevents access to sites like Penthouse, Amnesty International, Time and CNN, judging such sites as morally and politically degenerate. And criminal hackers beware. Recently, two brothers were sentenced to death for hacking into a bank computer network and stealing over 30,000 U.S. dollars. The Chinese government actually comes down very strongly on those types of hackers, or the traditional type of hacker that is committing uh, crime 
within China, was actually hacking you know, sites within China. Despite the strong arm of Big Brother, there's a newfound sense of bravado amongst the young. In Beijing alone, there are over 70 institutions of higher learning, including the famous Beijing University. But the communist stamp is still ever-present. Freedom of speech is met with an underlying current of uneasiness. It shouts, don't speak out too loudly or boldly. This could be the reason why so many underground internet cafes have opened up. They are luring the intellectually hungry with visions of international fair. is a hacker from Shanghai, China's booming financial center. From an early period, I learned about the internet from a series of articles my Taiwanese friend wrote. His name was Ku Fai. Some friends who knew I liked frogs changed my name to Cool Frog, and I've been using it since 98. Cool Frog was an excellent student, and before long he leapt into the internet and hacking. From there he mastered his art by regular visits to his favorite haunts, internet cafes. Last August, while chatting online with my friends, I discovered a piece of news. It was about how a taxi driver in Beijing was beaten up by four Japanese after vomiting in his car. Afterwards, they threw 500 yuan to him. Asked by the taxi driver to clean up the mess, the Japanese businessmen turned on him and beat him up instead. This story infuriated Cool Frog and together with some friends, they decided to hack into Japanese business websites and leave their mark. They feverishly defaced sites to leave messages of anger and disgust behind, demanding that the Japanese government apologize for the incident. Were Cool Frog and friends simply bored teenagers trying to create havoc and disorder? Or were they political hacktivists? The new breed of activists who protest under the cover of the internet. From my defense, Vice President and CEO, Brian Kelly. Trying to understand the motivation of a hacker or a group is, is really one of our greatest challenges. It's, it's an important component of understanding the threat. But what can happen if thousands of hacktivists come together in support of a cause? What we witnessed a few years ago were, were typically non-malicious type attacks, maybe driven by intellectual curios curiosity, a little competitive spirit. You know, can I deface a website? Can, can I gain access to a site? What we're seeing today, although there's our number of those attacks still exist, we're actually seeing uh, more of structured, targeted, sophisticated attacks. In China, groups of hacktivists have united in protest against what they see as crimes against their motherland. Who are they? Who are they after? And what devastation can they unleash? is a political hacktivist from Beijing, a hacker who uses the internet as a platform for political protest. 
He is inspired by China's long history. It may be over 2,000 years old, yet the Great Wall still stands today as one of the great wonders of the world. Stretching more than 6,700 kilometers, it was constructed to protect an ancient Chinese empire from marauding tribes. Over hundreds of years, it was constantly rebuilt by different ruling dynasties in an effort to keep the enemy out. Like the wars that the Great Wall has seen, lions are just as formidable except that his have no boundaries and his enemies are faceless. His hero is military marshal Ye Tianying, who came from Lion's hometown and who is known in history as one of China's top 10 generals. Seeing this great war reminds me of Marshal Ye Tianying, who comes from my home village. In 1955, he was recognized as one of China's greatest generals. He contributed tremendously to new China's advancements. His legacy, like this great war, is etched in the people's minds. Therefore, from young, I was influenced by him and was determined to be a hero and to help the people when I grow up. Lion's hometown is a rural village in South China. I'm Lion, and I was born on 7th October 1980 in Guangdong province, in a small and impoverished village. My father is a primary school teacher, and my mother is working in the government as a family planning officer. My parents are members of the Communist Party. In college, he mastered the computer and the internet. When I first started hacking on the internet, I used to download American software to hack into Taiwanese, Japanese, and American websites. But now I have no need to download them because I can write my own hacking programs. By rallying patriotic hacktivists together under the name of the Hackers' Union of China, Lion formed his own internet army, firmly believing that in numbers and unity, they will be a power to be reckoned with. The reason I formed Hackers' Union of China was because I felt that since there were so many youths online, there must be other patriotic youths like me. But maybe because they didn't have an outlet to express their patriotism. Therefore, I decided I wanted to bring these patriotic youths with hacking skills together. Then we would be stronger, and if our websites should be attacked by the Americans, for example, we could retaliate, and our power would be stronger. His members are called honkers, hong meaning red in Chinese. So it follows that Lion could be considered the cyber general of the Red Army, emulating his childhood hero, Marshal Ye Tianying. There are currently about 16 to 20 different underground unions in China. We think at least, you know, some 300 or so core members, leaders, 200, 300 of core leaders, and then 
uh, perhaps thousands of people who you know, sign on to the website, you know, exchange emails, and, and really it started in response to a political event, uh, a tragedy in Indonesia. The riots in Indonesia in 1998 began because the people believed they had been exploited by President Suharto and his corrupt government. These feelings of abuse kindled old hatred for the Chinese, the more successful entrepreneurs of their society. Chinese shops and businesses were burnt. A few years ago, the civil unrest in Indonesia resulted in many fellow Chinese being killed. Urged on by one another, the unions retaliated for the deaths of their compatriots in the only way they knew how. And it's something they wanted to, to avenge. And so since they felt that that wasn't being addressed properly by the Indonesian authorities, again in their view, uh, they began defacing Indonesian websites and really going after Indonesia as a target country. A year later, yet another international incident would provoke Lion's wrath. In May 1999, the U.S. Air Force accidentally bombed the Chinese embassy in Belgrade, resulting in the deaths of three Chinese journalists. These examples showed that China was not strong enough and could be bullied by others. This was a driving force behind my desire to be a patriotic hacker. The reason I hack is because I love my country. In protest, Chinese hackers defaced the homepage of the U.S. Embassy, replacing their web pictures with scrawled slogans like, Down with Barbarians. More injustices would follow, egging Lion and his army of soldiers on to do battle. In 1937, the Japanese army committed the Nanking Massacre and killed tens of thousands of Chinese. But in the year 2000, the Japanese parliament publicly denied the existence of the Nanking Massacre. The Nanking Massacre was one of the worst wartime atrocities ever to be committed against innocent civilians. For six weeks, an estimated 20,000 women were raped and brutally killed. 50,000 Chinese were annihilated, trying to flee by crossing the Yangtze River. In total, over 250,000 people were killed. In retaliation for the Japanese government's denial of such atrocities, Lion and his team of cyber warriors defaced Japanese government websites. Such injustices fed Lion's desperate hunger to seek revenge and elevate the status of his countrymen. But the biggest cyber war ever known between China and the US was about to take place. On April 1st, 2001, a US surveillance plane collided with a Chinese fighter jet over the South China Sea. The reason for the Chinese-American hacking war was because of the incident whereby a Chinese fighter plane was knocked down by an American surveillance plane and we lost our pilot. Normally, this would not have involved regular citizens. 
But some American hacker groups used this opportunity to attack our websites. For example, commercial and educational sites. The attacks lasted from 1st April to May. The Chinese launched nearly 1,000 attacks and are even believed to have caused denial of service on the White House website. The defaced sites were replaced with Chinese nationalistic slogans and photographs of the downed pilot. Red Moon was part of Lion Cyber Force. Lion issued a statement that we should retaliate to show our patriotism. On the 30th of April, he held an urgent meeting on the internet relay chat to ask us to come together in order to attack various American websites. However, we targeted government and military websites, not commercial ones. The American hackers went overboard as they attacked our commercial and educational websites. Who were these American hackers? Had they joined forces like the Chinese to defend their country? What we saw in this case was a very interesting phenomenon where one particular hacker or hackers, I think there are probably two of them that go by the name of Poison Box, is the name of that particular uh, hacker group, which was neither Chinese nor American, but actually from uh, one of the Baltic countries, we believe, uh, got involved, sort of uh, presented themselves as if they were the uh, Americans. They never explicitly said, I don't think, oh, we're from the U.S., but they started doing pro-U.S. and anti-Chinese defacements and, and launching you know, a great number of those. And what happened was that this triggered a Chinese response. Poison Box, possibly the worst kind of internet menace because he enjoyed taking bits of real news and causing friction between the actual people involved. But what happens in the cyber realm in both of these incidents was that one particular individual or two can, can exercise what, what amounts to a great deal of power in a situation like that and actually make it worse and create perceptions perhaps that, that hackers in that other country are, are united and, and fighting against your country and so you've got to do something about it. After weeks of combat, how will the cyber war between Poison Box and Chinese activists end? Eventually, a truce was declared. They actually called, uh, again, extraordinary, they called a press conference in China. And those three groups uh, invited uh, some journalists to come in. And they said, we're, we're deciding to stand down. Called into action, three union groups from China the Hackers Union of China, Green Army Corps, and China Eagle Union worked together relentlessly towards the common goal of obliterating U.S. sites. When it was time to stop, they responded just as quickly. In this hacking war, the Americans attacked us first. As the hacking continued, many hacker organizations from around the world joined in as well, and it seemed like there was no sense of control. Also, America had issued a statement regarding the imminent arrest of the hackers. Therefore, we decided to stop. In any case, we had already attacked some prominent websites in seven days, over 1,000. 
In terms of the number of websites attacked, we had already one. It was at this time that I thought of stopping it. I used a mass email list to spread the news to stop the hacking war. I also issued a statement on the website declaring the end of the war on May the 7th. Did U.S. hackers retaliate to China's attack? You don't generally see hackers in the West, you know, suddenly uh, trying to support, you know, a national effort, you know, like uh, administration policy or something like that. It's just, it, it's, uh, it's almost laughable. In China alone, there was a combined force of over 80,000 people who took part in this skirmish. With a potent cause in hand, how far will hacktivists go? Does the internet have the potential to be a much deadlier weapon? Are we entering the brave new world of the cyber terrorist? In a world that continues to advance technologically, will cyberspace become a new battleground? And can hacking go beyond juvenile pranks to much graver destruction? Terrorism. It's a word that strikes fear into hearts and minds around the world. Could the Internet become a new political weapon in the hands of terrorists? Already, U.S. intelligence has discovered that criminal hackers are offering their services to rogue states and terrorist organizations. 